the work that we do on ourselves for ourselves the work that we do with the mind is absolutely essential the words we use prior to them becoming words they were thoughts and in order to produce more words we must first be manufacturing and producing more thoughts and once the words are released out there into the world then they go ahead and trigger and ricochet off of the words and thoughts of others who might agree with or disagree with what we have to say and therefore our own production of reality which necessitates for us to go ahead back to the factory and churn up some more thoughts this time with perhaps a little bit more gusto and more of a drive to embellish and counteract and perhaps even destroy and forcefully change things meaning the words and therefore the thoughts of others to change the other to change the world around us as we try to make it fit what our image of the tolerable and acceptable and whatever is desired is to be seen in the world outside of ourselves meanwhile we can hardly tolerate ourselves the way we are as we usually are in a constant state of angst a state of discontent dissatisfaction the Buddha called that dukkha meanwhile as we try to build ourselves a more acceptable life a fuller life a happier life outside of ourselves I mean the outside conditions making us feel that now it is a fuller happier life because now it has the necessary criteria to make it so well others before us have tried this again and again and again since beginningless history we have examples in our history books you know both good and bad ones Alexander the Great whom I personally don't find him to be that great as he was demolishing destroying just you know Hannibal's of yesterday is another example the Jeff Bezos's and the Bill Gates's of today and tomorrow are all examples meanwhile the thing that is usually neglected is the one that has to do with the development of wisdom which interestingly enough doesn't have much if anything to do with outside criteria to enable us to create this quasi this pseudo full happy life basically this involves doing the work inside out so working on ourselves first fixing our glasses clearing up our eyes In a way, I see it to be quite similar to love. 
true, genuine love and wisdom, they, I see them very much synonymously. Although a person wants to be loved, in order for them to truly experience the full potential of love, And, and, and also to get, to gain the attention and love of the world around them, a person, uh, nature, etc. They must first have an appreciation and love for themselves. I mean, this is not something new, uh, but it still remains to be such a point, important point that is missed out on. To make this a healthy, loving interaction and the blossoming of love and the experiencing of it to the fullest potential, one must first develop the understanding and the capacity to love, just the capacity to love <laughs> within oneself. Before we get uh, others to love us, we go outside seeking for it in the in the world around us. We must learn to have it towards ourselves. To create the space of this knowing within us. The space to know how to love to begin with. So similarly with wisdom. Which gives us a fuller understanding of life an appreciation the taste the tasting capacity of life and dukkha becomes sukha suddenly which is the opposite of dukkha which is dissatisfaction when venerable ananda one day he was sitting and he was listing in his mind as to who this dhamma is for who fits the bill, if you will, of a person who truly could benefit the most? And Venerable Ananda, uh, Anuruddha, I'm sorry, is sitting and listing. He lists seven qualities. Meanwhile, the Buddha is far away from him. I believe he was in a monastery in Savat. He was watching his mind. He was observing Anuruddha's thinking. <laughs> And Venerable Anuruddha sitting there, he wasn't an arahant yet. He was pretty close. But he was listing how this dhamma, he says in his mind, is one of few wants, few wishes. This dhamma is for one who has contentment in his heart. Uh, he lists other things such as energy, Other things like mindfulness, collectedness of mind. But he leaves out one, and that's where the Buddha comes in and he says, Very good, Anuruddha, but you missed one. He says, You missed Papanchas. You said, This Dhamma is for that person who does not indulge in the proliferation of thoughts, the constant proliferation of thoughts, the mental conjuring of new, new, constant, 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 churning and churning and churning in the production of new thoughts, which, by the way, it needs to spew out, it needs to come out, of the mouth, of through our behavior, through our interactions with the world. And it screams of ignorance loudly. That's why I don't put too much faith in words, even though I use a lot of words. <laughs> but um, Ultimately, they're just too redundant. It's, they're too painful. There's, there's so much suffering involved. Because now you have to go out and then come up with new things, new thoughts, 
And that calmness of mind that we were struggling, in a sense, to create, to inculcate, to produce through our meditation practice, suddenly is gone because now the water surface is all, well, unsettled. The water is murky. There's restlessness in the mind. And we're kind of sitting at the edge of our seats, kind of cringing our teeth and just like hoping the other person doesn't say something. The, you know, um, for example, in this world of social media, every time you put a thought out there, you need to be prepared. As to how you will react, not as to what others will say, but how you would react to that. For that reason, I personally try to stay away from social media as best as I can, which is difficult. Currently, you know, the situation in Armenia where I'm at, it's in the middle of war. So you want to put certain messages out there, but we need to make sure, first of all, where the mind is. What is the nature of the thoughts involved in weaving out these words that I'm about to release into the world, digitally, or, I mean, in type or, or, or in words, actual videos or audios. So it's all about knowing ourselves, you know. It's, it, we have it in all the ancient traditions. You have it in Greece. You have it in parts of, I believe, Egypt as well, and, and obviously in India, in China. So knowing oneself, where everything we need is already there within us. All the necessary parts are here. We just need to learn how to use them, to understand and develop them. That's where the wisdom part comes in. That can help us to deal with whatever kind of uh, problem or trouble the world throws at us. But the wisdom is the thing that allows us to have a position to defend and to protect the principles that we have developed in life. And there's nothing uh, wrong in doing so. For that reason, we need to not have a blasé lifestyle. The Buddha's students, all those of us who practice his teachings, we need to have a position, a fundamentally good position in a sense. And that's where the three trainings come in, sila, samadhi, panya, the understanding, which comes from right understanding, harmonious perspective, or which is samaditi. We need to have that, but then we need to have the necessary support behind it to protect it. Oftentimes, we lack that considerate approach in protecting something beautiful. A, a, pers a principle that we find to be valuable and useful in the world today. There's nothing wrong in, 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 in stating those. Because we hold the responsibility for posterity. Those other human beings that will come after us. So we need to have a position that is based on the Dhamma, which doesn't go against nature. Dhamma is another word for nature, by the way. It's another word for truth, not just the Buddha's teachings. Of course, we use the Buddha's teachings also as Dhamma. Interesting that the Buddha didn't use another word for it because of the correlation between the two. So coming back to the personal work that we need to do and not buying into too much of this thinking machine that oftentimes is, is led by, you know, left hemisphere thinking. There's a wonderful book, by the, uh, by the way, uh, it's called The Master and the, His Emissary. Uh, by uh, Chris, uh, no, uh, 
professor and medical doctor um, Ian McGilchrist, a wonderful, wonderful book. I highly recommend it. And um, it's just, it's mind-blowingly beautiful and in, in, in its introduction and understanding of what the research is saying about this is beyond pop psychology that said, you know, who are, you know, right brain is responsible for creativity, left brain is for analytic. No, that's science is saying something else, the research. So they pretty much do the same thing, uh, but the right brain is more, uh, is able to understand implicit meaning, for example. It's far uh, more responsible in giving us. A, a different texture and understanding of life. And when we practice the teachings and we really taste the fruits of the meditative practices in this in this tradition, the personality changes. Basically the meaning the howness of how you know how things unfold, how we understand them in the world and within us, that texture completely changes. Which, as I read the book, I see how science is validating this. And it's interestingly enough, the the, the right hemisphere, which is a little bit bigger, and that's why it's called the master. The master. And I, as I look at the world today, I see how everything is like going in a linear fashion. Everybody's supposed to be doing the same thing, uh, thinking the same way. Otherwise, we're not accepted. We're becoming more standardized. And there's nothing. I look at you, there's every single one of you so different. So different. How can there be anything standard about that? But we send the kids out to school and we encourage them to take standardized testing. Schools do that. But the sad part is we bring that into our own personal lives. We bring these archetypes of the world, the narratives of the world, and we place them in our heads, which completely sullies the way we see. As I was referring to earlier, Checking the clarity of our glasses, spectacles, clearing up the eyes, meaning tossing out the useless narratives. And this is why the Buddha would always come back in the description of, of the Dhamma. It's, it's something that is to be realized by the wise for themselves. Pachatam veditam bo vinyuhiti. Each person's experience of the Dhamma is unique is unique. I know some uh, meditation uh, schools developing in the world today, um, they have teachers, which I'm glad they do, but the teachers oftentimes are given a sheet of questions, you know, the responses to a series of questions, and they're very standardized. I once saw this, and I just started laughing. Because each person's meditative experience is completely different. Yes, there are some commonalities, of course. They need to be there. But each person's understanding is different. And this is what I am trying to celebrate here today. And encourage you to trust in that. So long as your feet are strongly based on a clear understanding of the fundamentals of the Dhamma. And that's why we always need to go back to the suttas and the words of the Buddha. And not take my word for it or any other teachers. See if it matches your experience and your own discoveries in your own laboratory when you sit and meditate. So I will stop here and open for questions. Comments, critiques, thoughts. Yes? Again, it 
week I just learned such great things from you. Thank you so much. Um, but today I'm especially like the idea that the love of appreciation of oneself mm. is so important um, because so many people, especially young people, they want to look for Mr. Right, Mrs. Right. <laughs> And, and that caused a lot of suffering because there is no Mr. Right and Mrs. Right. And what I have discovered since my spouse left was that I am my Mrs. Right. And that makes me so happy. Not because I'm perfect, but precisely because I, I know what to strive for, not the standardized things. And I want to strive for being a better person. So I feel that unless, you know, this is something that you can do best by yourself. And that's why I told everyone, I don't want to get married ever again, because I'm so happy, you know, doing what this is very meaningful thing for me to do. And yes, when we try to do that, we do develop, for want of a better word, a kind of arrogance. In other words, we feel that we are confident in ourselves with all our imperfections. We don't have to live up to what the world sees us. And that is like the most liberating thing. So I really want to thank you. And, mm. and I, it's something that I want to share with my students too, that we don't need to live by these uh, external standards. As long as you, 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 you are confident about your own character. And just to kind of follow up again with, uh, I went through my period of mourning and, and so forth, but with other people who appreciate the same colleague. And one of the persons said, it's nice to be uh, this James Tong because even when we think about this person, all the memories are so happy that, that he did not leave us with a single negative thing to think about. You know, so we were laughing at, at the same time that you know, there might be tears. And this is like, gee, you know, I, I want to be like that. You know, when I die, I don't want people to mourn for me, but to have happy, happy memories because I, I was one here. So I, I just really want to thank you for this wisdom. I think it's, it is a, a very profound wisdom. Thank you. Life is best lived when we have um, lived it um, fully ourselves. Um, What I'm trying to flesh it out some more. The the feeling behind that is is very similar to traveling alone, whether it's metaphorical travel in life or an actual travel into uh, an area where you're a part of the world where you haven't been, and fully being exposed to the elements and to seeing the phenomena that are around you that are not the common you broke away albeit temporarily uh, but using that setting to tap into oneself to live life f within yourself within your skin and most of us we don't know how to do that we don't know how to live within our skin so we we have no other uh, option other than to go outside of ourselves and really look at the billboard look at what is on our you know social media feed and, and what a celebrity or this person or the news is telling us and there is a I think I might have mentioned this before in biology there is um, animal life is so fascinating there's a certain type of crab uh, I think it's called the imposter crab. Um, and what it does is basically it puts on, it, it has this, uh, it uses some part of its, I guess it's a saliva, which is very gluey, and it goes and grasps um, empty shells, uh, whether they're from, you know, big size shells of different animals that used to inhabit those shells, but now they're vacant. So it puts it on itself. So it builds this huge construction. 
very similar to papanchas, by the way, the proliferation of thoughts in the mind, which we take to be our reality, who I am. So this imposter crab walks around uh, or, you know, imitating some other form of an animal to intimidate possible predators or attract a mate. But if you go ahead and chip away all these other pieces that used to belong to other dead animals, then you'll see this, the, this tiny little crab that walks away. So often I see human beings to be living their lives like that. And we don't need to. Life is already, um, you know, has so much to offer each of us for growth, etc. But thank you for your input. Mm. Other thoughts? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I just wanted to uh, kind of comment on what you said at the very beginning when you were talking about uh, what was happening in Armenia and the kind of butterfly the butterfly effect because you know, uh, I live in East Hollywood and it's right in the middle between what's called Armenia town and Thai town and in both places of course there's a government you know anti-government protest in um, in Thailand right now and uh, also um, uh, of course in Armenia the uh, so the well, I don't know whether it's a civil war, but anyway, the war. So in East Hollywood, I see uh, cars with the Armenian flags, you know, on to the, on the windows driving around. And then, of course, you know, in Thai town, people are glued to the television, um, trying to figure out what's happening in, in Thailand. So it's like the whole world, whole world's away, but yet, you know, they're kind of connected still. Mm. So it just, uh, the other day I was driving and then, you know, a lot of cars with Armenian flags, uh, they usually have them displayed during the uh, commemoration of the, uh, the genocide. But mm -hmm. I guess these days, well, they, they put the flags back on, on the cars. So it's pretty, um, as you said, you know, the butterfly effect is, uh, well, it's alive and well, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, even even here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they usually display them during uh, the, the Armenian flags you mentioned on the Genocide Commemoration Day, which falls on April 24th. However, um, it's a pretty um, uh, loaded time period. Um, I use loaded because that's the only word that comes to mind to, to describe how it is. The, 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 uh, I'm here so I can, I can see it. I'm on the ground level and I, I actually started seeing patients again uh, as a psychotherapist um, this week because of the need, the human need, because there's so many people who have lost loved ones. And these are civilians that they're being bombed by the Azerbaijani and the Turkish and unfortunately, the Israelis are providing them with the, with the drones to destroy these villages. Um, so I'm, I'm meeting with individuals, human beings, uh, very young, that have now PTSD. Very young. And it's, it's mind-blowing as to like um, how much damage ignorance can, can do. And um, so it's very, um, it's interesting to create this space in one's mind to see things for what they are without adding further interpretations, further colorations of the defilements, for example. Um, that's why during last week's talk, I also emphasized how 
uh, it's important. The Buddha never said, go ahead and take it uh, lying down and just sacrifice yourself and your family and your whatever. Because these people here are really fighting for their survival, literally, because the second genocide is about to occur. And that's why everybody's going crazy with their flags and all that. And that's how dangerous it is. And the world is not doing anything. They say, condemn, we condemn it, etc. So in the midst of all that, how can a person, a practitioner, keep a cool-headedness? And that's where the practice has to really prove itself to oneself and the world around you. In other words, are you becoming the aggressor yourself? Is there the presence of hatred within you as you're trying to defend yourself. Now, I was mentioning this earlier this week to uh, a person, and I gave the example of the Kakachupama Sutta, which is the simile of the saw that the Buddha dis- uses to bring about, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful sutta about the, the level of metta that is beyond any measure. Meaning, he says, if there are two people using a, a saw that usually, you know, it's like a two, two individual saw that you use to cut down a, a tree. And if they're using that, he says, against you, and they're cutting you in half from the waist, and if you happen to have the slightest thought of ill will towards these people who are killing you, torturing you, then you are not practicing what I have been teaching. This is heavy. Now, I cannot go ahead and impose this on anyone, but I can try to live my life like that. That's my point. The Buddha was not saying, go ahead and live, all of you live like this. This is not something that anyone can do, or just, just any, any Joe could do. This is heavy. This is advanced. But at the same time, India was lost because many people misunderstood the teachings of the Buddha and they just threw their arms up and then threw away their weapons and allowed all of whatever marauding armies were coming in to take over, to take over. And they did. That's why we lost two of the greatest universities and also the Buddhist culture and the Buddhist teachings in India for over 800 years if not more. And so we need to practice discernment, clear judgment. And that's what I was saying earlier, that we need to take care of what is valuable in life. Again, simile of the saw is something that I can hold myself, well, it's, it's a, you know, accountable to, I guess. It's, it's a powerful standard to live one's life by. But I cannot go outside and advocate that to, let's say, here, the people of Armenia, who are literally, there are less than 3 million people here, the population. Meanwhile, the neighboring countries that are attacking, literally, are almost 100 million people. You see the discrepancy there? It's a landlocked country that doesn't have the ability to get its wounded to safety. For example, Georgia, the country of Georgia, closed its doors. And it's a Christian country. To the wounded, to get some attention, etc., etc. So how can you say to such a population, go ahead and, and, and become the person who lives up to that simile's ideal? Because you have enemy, an enemy that wants to disseminate you. On TV, they get up and say, our ancestors tried, but they failed, but we're going to succeed. So we are living in a world that is not the best. <laughs> and there's a lot of defilement. Now, do I want to contribute with further addition of my own defilement into the mix? Now, that is something I have control over. I cannot decide what others will do, 
but I do advocate for uh, resiliency and uh, sustainability and preservation of culture and civilization and I believe in evolution and I think one of the beautiful most beautiful traits that evolution has brought to us is are the Brahma Viharas for example to care for oneself as and for one's enemy as if a mother would care for her only son or only daughter now that is a wonderful trait so the situation around me is not going to dictate for me to relinquish that but that is you know somebody has to guard the border otherwise they're coming in to kill everyone there's that also that I have to negotiate uh, because there were individuals who were uh, saying, well, you're a bhikkhu, you shouldn't get involved in politics, and which is kind of um, insulting, because these individuals have not read the history, apparently, of, of this country and what my ancestors have gone through. But I just nod and just smile and, and let them be, and watch my mental proliferation. Because that's where the main show is. <laughs> Tomorrow the war will end. Guess what? You know, uh, I gave the example of, of, let's say, Switzerland or France. These are countries that have solid boundaries and no one's going to attack them. Or the U.S. Is there defilement there? <laughs> are people corrupt there? Yeah. It goes with the nature of the person and the culture. So it's all about the person's journey, ultimately. And that's where the main work needs to be done. Um, I hope I didn't get too sidetracked there, but I wanted to give you a, a more fuller response. No, thank you. Uh, you know, there were, uh, in a previous uh, talk, uh, not by you, but by uh, another monk uh, from Sri Lanka, he said that when he was a monk, he, uh, he had to go and bless, uh, they sent them to bless soldiers mm. who would be fighting, you know, some enemy and, you know, on the surface it seems not exactly Buddhist, but then again, uh, he was trying part of, you know, trying to preserve a Buddhist society uh, against, you know, against, against outsiders and, and so forth. So, as you said, you know, I guess situations are negotiable. I mean, it's possible that one might have to bless a soldier who's going to kill other people who are trying to kill you, right? I mean, it's sort of a, at least, you know, defensive act, right? Yeah. What you were saying, maybe I misunderstood. No, no. I, 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 well, I'm not going to go out and, and, and bless soldiers. I don't see that happening. Um, but... Um, It's important for the individual to be looking at the situation um, on a case-by-case -case basis also. Uh, for example, if I'm moving this, if I'm approaching it this way, um, the example of, of, of those two uh, monks from uh, the Zen tradition, the Chan tradition, uh, where you have an older monk who and a younger monk and the older monk sees they both see a, a, a young woman having a difficulty crossing the river and and she you know he allows her to you know he carries her basically the older monk etc and and drops her off on the other bank and that was in the morning at night time the two monks are sitting in the hut and the older monk is tossing and turning is like he says, Bhante, like, how did you, like, that, you broke a precept. You touched a woman. And he says, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course. He says, wow, your shoulders must be hurting terribly. Your back must be killing you. Because I carried her for less than a, a few minutes and dropped her off. You've been carrying her all day and up the mountain. So individual 
um, attention needs to be given, as in any major cases. So what I mean by that is, uh, in this context, is there any aggression on the part of the person that uh, that, that monk is going to go ahead and, uh, and bless, the Sri Lankan monk? Is, is that the case? Or is the person defending and this again is very tricky of course um, how well is the person's mind alert to be cognizant of okay do I have hatred when I am defending my children my wife from being slaughtered so my grandparents used to my grandmothers would have told me how they had observed their own parents having you know uh, it's a gruesome image I have to warn you uh, being you know having their throats slit in front of their eyes in their home in Urfa in Turkey today in 1915 this happened actually happened and not just them it happened to many 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 people many families lost their great-grandparents today because of such incidents so would in such a situation if you or I are there and this is happening and it is happening for example last week an Armenian soldier was caught um, and he was skinned alive skinned alive in the 21st century and no CNN no BBC is going to report this skinned alive and then um, shot and a video was made so um, it's 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 difficult to kind of put an umbrella and say this is how it's supposed to be like a black and white but my position as a bhikkhu is very clear where is, is there a presence of defilement if I'm the person who's being for example skinned alive I need to ask uh, you know my Ideally, I would be in a position of, con of thinking about, okay, the presence of the defilement. Now, as a bhikkhu talking to a person, like the Sri Lankan bhikkhu talking to that soldier, is he promoting hatred? Or is he blessing the soldier to have a purer mind and heart while he's defending the villagers? That would be something that I would be looking at it on an individual basis. That's what I meant by. But to promote the soldier to go ahead, yes, you have our blessings to go ahead and kill like they did in the Crusades or they still do in parts of the world. That is something that, to my understanding, the Dhamma can never agree with. So I'm trying to answer as best as I can. Of course, other bhikkhus, other teachers would give you a total different uh, response. Um, this would be mine at the moment. Yeah, it's definitely engaged. It's definitely putting the teaching on 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 uh, on the lab counter to be experimented with to see if it really holds water if it really is worth its weight in gold uh, oftentimes this is where we see whether it was just very superficial our understanding of it anyhow and because ultimately I always come back to the humanity is there humanity there being exercised being being present or is there hatred? One time I met a, an older gentleman and he had fought in the Iran war, Iran-Iraq war. And uh, he described a, an incident where uh, it was almost like hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was that close and it was very much like uh, it's both the front line I guess and it was very smoky it was foggy so visibility was nil 
and um, he was um, using his rifle, automatic rifle, to to just barrage bullets towards the enemy side that he couldn't see anything, but he knew that they were shooting back at him. And at that moment, he heard uh, the the words. Uh, I'm trying to say it in, in like um, in English, transliterate as you know uh, as best as I can. He says, "Ouch, mom!" Something like that. Help me, mom! Like it's the first word that came to the person as he was shot, apparently. And this soldier, who was also participating in the shooting on the battlefront, he stops. He puts his rifle away and he looks around and he rushes towards where he's hearing these cries of help. And he finds this person. And he ca carries him towards his side and, and, and he takes care of him. And then, you know, a few days later he, he gives him back to the enemy's side because he's the enemy, right? This is a beautiful um, demonstration in my mind of humanity because both of these young boys at that time were fighting and following orders. But something came to view, for one of them at least, and that is a beautiful thing that gives me hope about humanity. Um, and, and uh, you know, yeah. I wanted to share that. It's a lot, I know. We're going through a lot. And, you know, COVID-19 is still wreaking havoc around the world. So we haven't recovered from that. It's still messy. Uh, so there's so much going on around the world. The brain, the human brain, is like overloaded with so much. That's why I was encouraging you guys earlier before we sat to dedicate more time for you to go back to your corner like in a boxing ring. A boxer gets, I think, 12 or 15 rounds or whatever, but they need to take a rest. We need to take that rest. We need to give ourselves that meditation, period. And not take it for granted, like, yeah, I got this. No, I can go for 12, 15 rounds, no problem. No. No one is that solid, especially these days. So I need you to really protect yourselves. Get some rest, get some... Oh, then the meditation practice that you have going for you is, is wonderful. Reading the suttas really helps. Really, really helps. Any thoughts, questions, critiques, comments? Practice related or not? Yes. Hi. Hi. Hello, thank you for opening the space again. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for everything that everybody said as well. I've got so much from it. Um, I watched something today that when I was listening to a few people talk, including yourself, Bante, it reminded me a little bit about the meditation practice. And it was like a nature documentary in which this man was snorkeling, essentially, with just um, the underwater creatures, and he made friends with an octopus. And um, he said at the end of the uh, documentary that what he'd realised for him and his son, who then ended up joining him out there, was that he was actually part of the environment. He wasn't just a visitor and that he was part of nature. And I guess that kind of made me think about acceptance. Um, and then he said what it did for his son, what he saw in his son was that it gave him a stronger sense of identity, um, a confidence, but that the greatest gift that nature would give him was gentleness. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, in terms of... Um, war zones and things like that I've got no experience of that and it sounds horrendous my heart goes out to everybody 
But I guess the only um, experience of a war zone that I would ever say I had was in my own mind and that um, you can't fight fire with fire, I, th I think is what I'm trying to say. So accepting that the war is going on and sending love and kindness to it helped my mind to sort of expand and accepting that the, the habitat is what it is today will then allow it to change. Um, and that, that gives me a greater sense of self and a, a greater confidence <laughs> and uh, a, a gentleness that I've never had before. So while I was listening to you all talking, now, that's kind of where I was and what I was thinking of. Um, I just thought I'd comment on it. So thank you. Oh, sad, sad, sad. Of course. Uh, a, a person this week um, asked me whether really a human being can influence what's happening in the world and she she was completely uh, distraught and almost incoherent at times when I met with her and she was in disarray and she really was desperate for an answer and I said absolutely we can but it's like the hurricane. The hurricane's outer reaches, the circumference, if you will, is the most devastating part. It slaps things around, structures, buildings, statues, sculptures. It destroys life. But oddly enough, the closer you get to the center, that's where the eye of the hurricane is, where there's stillness and silence. And I said, look at you. You're all over the place. You're not able to find that space within you, that quietude and comfort. How in the world are you going to go ahead and help anyone outside of you? We can't do that. However, if you are there in that still silence of purity, of kindness, we can absolutely change the world. Perhaps not in the way that you and I would like things to be or quick enough, for the wars to end, for the bloodshed to stop, for peace to come back. But we can definitely create a certain atmosphere. But first and foremost, it has to be coming from a place that is similar to the outcome, in a sense. So if I want there to be metta, I want there to be loving kindness in this area where there's trouble then I need to have that within me manifested first. And I love the image of the environment and, uh, and the father and son. And for some reason in our culture, and this is also like a left brain thinking, uh, linear thinking that has led us down this path, which negates the fullness of the environment that we live in. Meaning, we always presume that the environment is outside of me outside of this body. Meanwhile, we are the environment. We are part of the environment. I totally understand the, the joy and, and the bliss of this person in a scuba diving or scar, you know, snorkeling. If you get a chance to do it, it's wonderful. Try it. It gives you a total appreciation of life above the surface of water when you're depending on the, on the scuba tank uh, you know it's wonderful and seeing life and it's like oh, i've been missing out so much on life and then you truly see you're part of the environment or go and walk into the forest if you have one nature and it's it's a enormously powerful therapeutic arena you don't have to do anything just walk close to the trees Remember, Paul? <laughs> in, in, yes. We were walking in the forest in, in, in the UK, uh, close to Paul's house, and, and we just stood there still for a while next to the trees, and it was just wonderful. And there's a, there, there's a reason why the Buddha would love to sit under trees. And even today, science is saying that you know the roots and the, there's a certain energy field around uh, trees. And I've heard one person say, well, they take away our negative energy. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's interesting.
worth experimenting. Any last thoughts, comments? But thank you for that wonderful uh, addition. Appreciate your thoughts. Okay, so in that case, let us uh, share some merits. Oh, by the way, on um, I was notified yesterday from uh, the temple that I used to give talks um, back when I was a layperson um, in Los Angeles, the IBMC, um, where I'm a part of, and they contacted me, uh, informing me that they would like me to give a, a Dhamma talk on the second Sunday in November, which I believe is the 8th. Um, and that will be um, the 8th of November at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time or uh, California time. So, um, and it will be on Zoom. So once I find out further details, uh, whoever would like, um, and you're not on their mailing list or email list, I would I will send you the link and the details. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Same place, same time. <laughs> Let's share some merits. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the achievement of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May all beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Stay well, be well, be gentle with yourselves, practice, uh, practice, but don't take it too seriously. Don't let us not lose our humanity, our beautiful humanity, no matter what. And uh, the best example for me, at least, is the life of the Buddha. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here and for all your participation. Be well. See you next week.